It doesn't matter in California. He's not going to take California. He's not going to take well, any state. None of right? this matters anywhere. The That's only right. only thing that he can do <laughs> is like take away enough votes that he shifts it from either Trump to Harris or Harris to Trump. That That is the only thing he can do here. Welcome to Law and Chaos. Today, we'll be talking about America's future Secretary of Polio reintroduction, RFK Jr., who is absolutely, positively not going to be president, but who has presented us with many fun legal issues all the same. And for Patreons, we've got Ron DeSantis' holy war to protect the cows. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get after it. Happy Friday, Chaos Monkeys. I'm Liz Dye, and with me as always is Andrew Torres. Andrew, how are you? <laughs> hey, Liz. I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. I just dropped my youngest child off at Hogwarts. Um, it's not It's not actually <laughs> called Hogwarts. It's just a, a beautiful college in, in the middle of Pennsylvania. And, uh, you know, I'm okay. It's it's going to be okay. Yeah, I. it's always something when they leave the house. But, uh, you know, she's she's attending a beautiful magic college. So uh, you've got to be happy for that. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm hopeful that she comes back with a degree in spells. <laughs> well, with that in mind, before we begin the main segment, it's time to update our listeners on two matters that we've been covering. First, in Trump world, we have been laughing uproariously at the strange odyssey of Kraken lawyer Stephanie Lambert, who uh, just managed to evade sanctions despite her misconduct in 2020 election denial cases in both Michigan and Pennsylvania. I mean, not entirely, since she's under indictment for multiple felonies. But until this week, she's been practicing law, defending Overstock.com weirdo Patrick Byrne, who's been sued by Dominion Voting Systems for, you know, defaming the hell out of them. Yeah, this is a story I, I cannot let go, which is why I wrote about it and we'll actually be doing a big show on it next week. Um, but let's just say it's not an easy thing for a lawyer to get herself disqualified from a case. So big mazo counselor. It's not everybody <laughs> could do what you did. OK, second, in our last episode, we talked about the oppressive lawsuit filed by free speech warrior Elon Musk against the World Federation of Advertisers for their work under the moniker Global Alliance for Responsible Media, or GARM, which promulgated standards for advertisers like don't let our ads run next to murder or terrorism or pro-Nazi propaganda. And so ex-Twitter filed a suit in the Northern District of Texas, Wichita Falls Division, for the obvious and express purpose of drawing Judge Reed O'Connor, uh, who is not only one of the most right-wing judges in the country, but also one of the most receptive to crazy conspiracy theories. Uh, Musk did exactly the same thing in his lawsuit against Media Matters for America, which we've covered. And unbelievably, that case didn't get kicked for having lack of venue since Media Matters and its reporter Eric Hanunoki, who reported the story that Elon Musk's website was showing ads next to explicitly Nazi content. Um, so Musk sued Media Matters. But Media Matters is in D.C. And Twitter is not in Wichita Falls. And yet Judge Reed O'Connor seems perfectly content to let this case stay with him. Or maybe, right? Because the day after our last show aired, Judge O'Connor recused himself from the Garm lawsuit. And this is really interesting because, Liz, as you point out, to date, he is still the judge in the Media Matters case. And let's unpack that a little bit. Rule 7.1 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure requires parties to make certain initial disclosures. And courts also typically have local rules that supplement those disclosure requirements, right? The baseline rule from the Federal Rules is designed to apply in diversity cases, right? That is a case that would otherwise be in state court, but can be brought in federal court because the parties come from different states. So mm -hmm. you have to list the citizenship of all the parties and corporations have to identify their parent companies. In the Northern District of Texas, the local rules also require a party to identify all interested persons so that the parties and the court can identify potential conflicts of interest. So specifically that those local rules require that you file with the court a complete list of all persons, associations of persons, firms, partnerships, corporations, guarantors, insurers, affiliates, parents or subsidiary corporations, or other legal entities that are financially interested in the outcome of the case. And... In the Media Matters case, X Twitter filed their disclosure statement, and in that section, they said only X Corp and X Corp shareholders. And 
that's almost certainly because Judge O'Connor, in his mandatory judicial disclosures, has indicated that he owns somewhere between $15,000 and $50,000 worth of Tesla stock. Right. So Media Matters filed a motion in that case to require ex-Twitter to supplement its disclosure statement to list Tesla as an interested party, which would pretty clearly force Judge O'Connor to recuse himself. And Media Matters has a lot of arguments that basically amount to, like, as goes Twitter, so goes Tesla. Because if Elon wrecks Twitter by sidling up to Nazis, or if he files garbage lawsuits in Twitter's name, that harms Tesla as well. And probably the most straightforward evidence, as Media Matters put it in his case, is is that after Musk endorsed the anti-Semitic tweet central to this case, Tesla's share price fell. The headlines speak for themselves. Advertisers flee X. Tesla shares drop 4% as Elon Musk retweets anti-Semitic posts. That's, that's a headline which they quoted. So under the federal recusal statute, which is 28 U.S.C. section 455b4, a federal judge shall recuse himself in cases where he knows that he, individually or as a fiduciary or his spouse or minor child residing in his household, has a financial interest in the subject matter in controversy or in a party to the proceeding or any other interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome of the proceeding. Right. And the standard there is what the judge knows. So perhaps you can infer that Elon Musk didn't list Tesla as an interested party to give Judge O'Connor cover to say he didn't know that the case might affect the price of the stock that he owns. Right. If every time it gets reported that Musk is endorsing anti-Semitic crap, your stock goes down. It doesn't seem like a stretch to say that qualifies as a financial interest in the outcome of a case about Musk suing people who report that he endorsed anti-Semitic crap. So that motion has been fully briefed as of July 22nd, but that's still pending before Judge O'Connor. Right. And that takes us to Wednesday, which is that ex-Twitter filed the exact same disclosure statement in the World Federation of Advertisers GARM case, right? And just as before, Musk deliberately did not list Tesla as an interested party. And yet... Judge O'Connor recused himself anyway. Now, he didn't issue a written statement. He doesn't have to explain why he recused himself. But I think the writing is on the wall that he's going to recuse in the Media Matters case, right? And and I think that's instructive for why we keep talking about these kinds of stories, right? Because we keep exposing this sort of stuff. And litigants keep trying because look like we might not be able to shame clarence thomas into not taking that rv from harlan crow or you know another (laughs) multi-million dollar trip around the world or whatever but like i think it makes a difference when we shine a light on stuff like you know musk forum shopping his way to a judge who happens to own a whole bunch of his stock yeah i i don't know whether i agree with you about i mean i do i agree with you a hundred percent that it makes sense to shame them i don't know if Reed O'Connor will recuse himself, just because I think he's a crooked son bitch and he's gonna do what he's <laughs> gonna do, right? Like there's there's no rhyme or reason that he would have kept that case, which has no connection to the venue in in Texas, and yet he did. So I'm not sure that he's making a like a rules based analysis here. I it's it's always good to have someone willing to take the under <laughs> because you know we've been disappointed a lot. Okay. All right. <laughs> With that in mind, now let's talk about RFK Jr., who somehow is not the weirdest candidate in the 2024 U.S. presidential election. Okay. If you are a subscriber, then we're going to get right to it. And if not, well, you could become one at lawandchaospod.com. That's on Substack or at patreon.com slash lawandchaospod, where you get all the shows ad free and you get some extra goodies too. But if not, We will see you in a moment after we pay some bills. And we're back. Okay, Liz, let's now talk about Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is somehow not the weirdest candidate in this 2024 U.S. presidential election. I mean, as we record this, Donald Trump is reported to have given, I've not watched this, but he did a press conference at Bedminster, you know, his club in Bedminster, I think. And it was like staged with all of these boxes of like Cheerios and giant cans of Folgers 
coffee. And I think what was supposed to happen is that he was supposed to be talking about inflation, but he's the least disciplined human being on planet Earth. And so uh, he instead talked about windmills killing bald eagles, which is like his thing because he's a he's an environmentalist. He just he just keeps it on the DL. I, I don't know. So as I would agree with you. RFK Jr. is somehow not the weirdest candidate in this race. <laughs> All right. So on Tuesday, August 13th, Judge Christina Reba, or it might be Reba, New Yorkers can can tell us, she's a state trial court judge in New York. She ruled that Kennedy is ineligible to appear on the state's presidential ballot this November. She said, it is ordered in a judge that the New York State Board of Elections is hereby directed not to place and or print the name of respondent candidates as candidates of the We the People independent body on the official ballots to be used at the general election to be held on the fifth day of November 2024. And um, Kennedy has already appealed, but the clock is ticking. And this ruling has the potential to upend Kennedy's pending applications in every single state. Yeah, Kennedy is already on the ballot in 19 states of the closest swing states. And again, don't try and predict swing states. Just get out and vote for Harrison Walls. But uh, of the closest swing states, Kennedy has been approved in Michigan and North Carolina. He's set to appear on those ballots. He has applications pending in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, and Nevada. If you're feeling frisky, he's also on the ballot in Texas (laughs) and pending in Florida. You know, things are going well. Don't jinx it. Don't jinx it. I know. Okay. And let me say right now, none of us know whether RFK is helping or hurting Harris, right? He was definitely hurting Biden. We also don't know if Kennedy's support, which is already down to about 4%, will, you know, all but evaporate come November. I I think that's probably pretty likely, but we don't know, right? But I agree with you that this ruling in New York will likely prompt a flurry of activity to try and get Kennedy off the ballot everywhere. And so let's talk about it. Okay. So here's what happened. Once RFK Jr. decided he was going to run as an independent rather than contest the Democratic nomination, he needed to meet various state requirements to get listed on the ballot. So in New York, that's Section 6140 of the election law, which specifies the form of an independent nominating petition and requires for statewide office that you get 45,000 signatures. Section 6140 specifies that the candidate must list their, quote, place of residence, and the New York courts have determined that this is a matter of prescribed content, meaning that you have to strictly comply with that part of the statute. For matters of form, like do you have any stray marks outside the lines, or is it paginated properly, or are the margins correct, or is it spelled right? Look, you only have to show substantial compliance with that stuff. Right. And that makes sense, because for most political offices, where you live is indeed a material requirement, right? You don't want to kick somebody off the ballot for screwing up, you know, the the way you spell alderman or something like that. But, but you do want to kick somebody off if they live in District 8 and they're trying to run in District 7. So Kennedy got together his independent nominating petition and his 45,000 signatures, and he filed it on May 28th. And the New York State Board of Elections approved it. But then two weeks later, four New York voters filed a petition under New York State election law seeking to invalidate Kennedy's nominating petition, which qualified him to appear as a candidate for president on the November ballot. The voters are represented, well, they were, they were represented by Kaplan Hecker Fink. Um, and if that sounds familiar to you, that is the firm which represented E. Jean Carroll successfully. And also represented the Center for Countering Digital Hate, which was sued by Elon Musk and won a slap judgment against him in California. Mm-hmm. That's that's why he doesn't file it in California anymore. But that firm, <laughs> the so the, the lead attorney at Kaplan, Hecker Fink, w- uh, was Roberta Kaplan. She's now started her own firm called Kaplan and Martin, but I believe she's still entered on this case. Uh, she's she's a rock star and uh, I yeah. have so much <laughs> admiration for her. Anyway, the voters raised 55 separate challenges to the nominating petition, including to the authenticity of the signatures and whether the campaign properly disclosed to people what they were signing, all the typical stuff. But their main argument was that Kennedy's nominating petition lied about his address. Right. On that nominating petition, Kennedy lists his address as a spare bedroom that he rents at 84 Croton Lake Road in Katona, New York, 10536. It's a little weird because Kennedy married Curb Your Enthusiasm actress Cheryl Hines way back in 2014, and Hines definitely lives in Los Angeles. (laughs) 
Yeah, it's uh, th- this whole thing is a giant curb your enthusiasm episode. It, 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 I mean, you know, yeah, democracy's on the line, and like this Joker could be the you know the Jill Stein of 2024, which is not so funny. But everything else that happened here, hilarious. Yeah, and and this is a lot weird because the entire house at Croton Lake Road is in foreclosure, and yet somehow RFK Jr. didn't seem to know that the place he lives was in foreclosure until he read about it in the New York Post. So, you know, as we said, usually when candidates lie about where they live, it's to meet residency requirements for a particular office, right? But but obviously, you don't have to live in New York to run for president in New York. You can be a resident of California, you can be a resident of Idaho, doesn't matter. What gives? And the answer, I think you and I both clearly think, is RFK Jr.'s running name, yeah. Nicole Shanahan, who is also a resident of California. Now, to be clear, there have been a lot of <laughs> there have been a lot of missed coverage on this. There is nothing in the Constitution or any federal or state law that prohibits the president and vice presidential candidate from both being from the same state. But the Constitution does specify in two places, first in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 3, and then again in the 12th Amendment, that when the presidential electors meet to cast their ballots, quote, the electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom, at least, shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. So, That means that if both candidates are from California, then the California electors can't cast their ballots for Kennedy and Shanahan, or sort of. Because, look, although this requirement was super important in the era of powdered wigs, this is not a particularly onerous requirement in the 21st century, right? Like, in 2000, Dick Cheney was a resident of Texas when he recommended himself to George W. Bush, who was also a claimed resident of Texas, as the best possible vice presidential candidate. And like all Cheney had to do was change his residency to Wyoming. And that's how Liz Cheney got to Wyoming. Weird. Yep. Okay. But this year, before Donald Trump picked the couch dude, he at least teased that he was going to, he actually vetted Florida Senator Marco Rubio to be his running mate, which is hilarious after the whole little Marco thing. <laughs> now, if Trump, you remember, you remember when little Marco said like, there's something wrong with your hands. And he was like, there's nothing wrong with the size of my hands. And that was, and we were like, there's no way these jackasses are going to get elected. Anyway, never never underestimate the sycophancy of Marco Rubio. But yeah, (laughs) I will not. Okay, so if Trump had chosen Rubio, he was absolutely not going to like give up Florida's 30 electoral votes, nor was he going to move back to New York after having switched his residency to Florida in 2019. He really likes to avail himself of the Florida state and federal court system. And he was never, ever, ever going to make himself a domiciliary of the uh, Empire State again. I'll tell you that for free. So instead, what would have happened is that Trump would have made little Marco change his residence. So as long as either Trump or Rubio was not an inhabitant of the same state, like if one of them on the on December 17th, when they tabulate the electors, if one of them lived somewhere else, then they you know it would be fine. The electors could meet and formally cast their votes for Trump Rubio. And Rubio could have even waited to see in November whether Trump lost before having to actually relocate. Yeah. Or, or if the election were to be <clears throat> uh, disputed, yeah, Rubio virtual right, almost certainly could have moved. And then if it were ascertained that they lost, still kept his job in the Senate. Right. I mean, not that I could figure out why Rubio would want to keep the Senate job he clearly hates and almost never shows up for. But nevertheless, Article One, Section three of the Constitution says that no person shall be a senator who shall not have attained to the age of 30 years. Rubio's over 30 and been nine years a citizen of the United States. Also meets that requirement and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state for which he shall be chosen. Right. So Rubio was a resident of Florida when elected in 2022. So, yeah, he can move out of the state afterwards and play all his constituents for suckers. I mean, he's been doing that already. But uh, I, look, not that any of this matters anymore. I just hate. Right. And and it's not going to matter to RFK either. But it seems to be why he lied on that application, because unlike Mm -hmm. Trump and Rubio, Kennedy can't just tell his vice presidential sugar mama to move to Idaho or something because she's the one bankrolling his presidential fantasy band camp. Shanahan was formerly married to Google founder Sergey Brin and um, 
That's why she has all the money in the world and uh, clearly isn't going to move out of California. So Kennedy had at least two other non-lying options. First, he could have just not contested California, which like, I mean, he's not going to win California anyway, so who cares? But then again, he's, he's not going to win anywhere. And admitting that you've given up on the largest state in the union's 56 electoral votes is probably kind of tacitly acknowledging that you are running a bullshit, not real campaign. Um, yeah. Although one of the two things people know about you is that you have brain worms and that you murdered a baby bear and staged its body in Central Park. And also that you are responsible for like single handedly bringing back measles. Maybe you should welcome any <laughs> other press you can get. Yeah. So in the alternative, Kennedy could have arranged for his California electors to vote for him for president and, you know, some non-Californian for vice president. Like, there is no constitutional requirement that your electors in California cast the same votes as your electors in any other state. So I, the, the point of all of this, but beyond making fun of RFK, which is always a, a, a good time, is that there were a lot of other options besides the lying. Yeah. And we keep saying lying. I, I mean, I don't want to get sued for defamation. So let's explain what we mean here as a matter of law. This is an election law challenge. So the standard of proof is clear and convincing evidence, which this, that's what the petitioners, that is the voters challenging Kennedy's right to be on the ballot, they have to prove. And that's a that's a high bar. It means that even if the court thought it was more likely than not that Kennedy lied about his residence, unless this judge was convinced that it was highly probable that Kennedy didn't live at the Croton Ro Lake Road address, she was was required to keep Kennedy on the ballot, and she did not. So under New York election law, that's section 1-104, residence is defined as that place where a person maintains a fixed, permanent, and principal home, and to which he, wherever temporarily located, always intends to return. And so the case law shows us that at trial, the individual has to show that he has an intent to reside at the specific address, coupled with a physical presence, quote, without any aura of sham. <laughs> Yeah. And so that led to a rather uh, interesting strategy that Kennedy took at trial. So he argued first that he absolutely intends to permanently reside in the town of Bedford, county of Westchester and state of New York, and that he has a bunch of contacts there. And, and then second, in any event, the reason he listed a fake address of a retroactively rented room that he doesn't that he definitely doesn't live at on his application is because he was following the advice of counsel. So put, put, put a pin in that second one. <laughs> so let's first look at the evidence of Kennedy living in New York. And we will get right to that after this brief ad break, unless you are a patron or supporter over at uh, lawandcastpod.com, at which point we'll get right there. Okay, so first, Kennedy filed his federal FEC, Federal Election Commission, Form 2 Statement of Candidacy, back when he was trying to run as a Democrat on April 5th, 2023. That's about a year before he picked Nicole Shanahan as his running mate and before he had any reason to lie about where he lived. And on that application, Kennedy listed his address as the address in Los Angeles, California, where he's actually lived with Cheryl Hines for the last 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Second, Kennedy said he began renting the spare bedroom at Croton Lake Road in 2023, but admitted that he never slept there until June 25th, 2024, which is two weeks after the petitioners challenged that he didn't live in New York. And there was no written lease, right? Kennedy never paid a dime to his supposed landlord until May 20th, 2024, which just happened to be a day after a New York Post article ran showing that the Croton Lake Road house was in foreclosure. And third, it wouldn't be a modern election story without claims of political persecution. <sighs> so let us quote from Kennedy's affirmation about why a world famous person with a lot of money all of a sudden needed to move into someone's spare bedroom for a year and a half. He says, upon my decision to contest the Democratic Party's 2024 nomination for the office of president of the United States in March 2023, my friend and landlord, David Michaelis, requested that I move out of my residence at Two Twin Lakes Road as he remains a supporter of President Biden. Except that at trial, Michaelis testified rather credibly. I mean, he clearly came off as a longstanding friend of, of RFK, but 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 he did testify 
A, that he never collected any money from Kennedy whatsoever and was never his landlord, and B, that Kennedy did occasionally visit him, but stopped doing that altogether around 2017, and most damningly C, that uh, Michaelis's house is at one Twin Lakes Drive and not two Twin Lakes Road. Yeah, I mean, who among us has not repeatedly forgotten our own address and put it on legal <laughs> documents? But okay, Kennedy lied. Fine. Like, I, I feel comfortable saying that Kennedy lied. Why is this a big deal? Well, once again, I'm going to quote Kennedy himself, this time from his pretrial memorandum. He says, the proof at trial will demonstrate that Mr. Kennedy and Team Kennedy consulted with highly qualified legal counsel, that, that would be his attorney, Paul Rossi, in designating the Croton Lake Road Katona address as the residence to be listed on his nominating petitions, not just in New York, but in all the states in which Mr. Kennedy has made application to be on the presidential ballot. So in other words, this might not end in New York because this dipshit made the false attestation about his address on all of his applications in every state. Again, not that this would have mattered at, at, in any state other than California, but yeah, th there we are. So, okay. It didn't matter in California. He's not going to take California. He's not going to take well, any state. None of right? this matters anywhere. The only, right. only thing that he can do <laughs> is like take away enough votes that he shifts it from either Trump to Harris or Harris to Trump. That That is the only thing he can do here. Yeah, that is exactly right. So you previewed, and, and let's talk about Kennedy's fallback argument, which is that, okay, even if that address was false, he listed it upon advice of counsel. Now, We've talked about the advice of counsel defense before, largely in the context of the criminal prosecution of Donald Trump and how Trump wanted to abuse it in the stolen documents case in Florida. And actually, we've talked about it a bunch with respect to Steve Bannon, who said that his buddy Robert Costello told him it was totes <laughs> cool to just give the finger to Congress and defy a congressional subpoena, which is which is why our pal Steve is in jail right now, because... That's not a thing with respect to that that law, contempt right. of Congress. <laughs> but the important thing from a legal perspective is that you can offer up advice of counsel as a defense. But when you do so, you are waiving attorney-client privilege in connection with that advice. So the other side gets to ask the lawyer about the details of the advice that they've supposedly offered that's exculpatory. Which is why... When the documents case comes back from the 11th Circuit, and also with respect to the election interference case, Trump's election interference case, he said that he's going to use an advice of counsel case. He is not going to use an advice of counsel case because he is not going to waive privilege with respect to what his lawyers told him. That bullshit's never going to happen. Yeah, absolutely right. And look, this highlights a, a really interesting question that, that you asked me, which is advice of counsel typically manifests itself in criminal proceedings, right? You are saying, don't prosecute me for doing this crime. I lack the necessary mens rea to form a criminal intent because I was just doing something my lawyer told me was fine. Is it available in civil cases? Is it available in a quasi-administrative proceeding like this? And Yeah, I was hurtling. Around. I mean, I'm in the passenger seat, but I'm like hurtling around the back roads of uh, Pennsylvania typing like, I don't understand. How could there be advice of counsel in this case? It's not like, you know, it's not even a tort case. It's just like, a, are you entitled to be on the ballot case? How could advice of counsel be be available to him here? Yeah. And, and I have actually seen it in insurance coverage cases, right? Because one of the things that will happen when an insurer declines to advance funds or defend a case or otherwise get involved is that the other side will say, oh, you were deliberately targeting me or retaliating or whatever, right? the, the policyholder. And sometimes the insurers will actually claim an advice of counsel defense. And they'll say, no, look, we're going to put on all of our communications with our lawyers that shows all we were doing was making a legal coverage determination. So it does happen. But I have to tell you, I've never seen it come up in an elections case before. And I, and I think it goes to show you, right, as we talk about what happens in the future, that this judge really did bulletproof her opinion, right? Like, mm -hmm. this is going to mm -hmm. stand on appeal. And w one of the reasons is, right, you know, who knows, but by God, she was going to let Kennedy raise this advice of counsel defense. And in, in fact, let's talk about that a little bit, because whenever you raise an advice of counsel defense, it leads to dueling motions in limine, right? And that happened here, because Kennedy wanted to very narrowly confine what 
constituted the waiver of attorney-client privilege. He wanted to define it as just, quote, the narrow issue of legal advice received from attorney Paul A. Rossi Esquire with regard to the listing of the Croton Lake Road address on Mr. Kennedy's New York nominating petition, end of quote. And that last part is crucial because the voters, right, the, the petitioners challenging Kennedy's right to be on the ballot, wanted to ask Rossi not just about the petitions in New York, but about the other states. And they also argued that Kennedy uh, had stiffed them on discovery that they were entitled to about Rossi. And again, as we suggested, Judge Ryba uh, sided with Kennedy on all of these, right? She let him call Rossi to the stand. She precluded the plaintiffs, the petitioners, from asking Rossi about any of the other states or anything else. And she did so on Rule 403 grounds, right? The New York equivalent of that. That is that evidence gets excluded if its prejudicial effect would outweigh its probative value. So here's what Rossi said. He says, Kennedy has three addresses, one in Massachusetts, which everyone is aware of, Hyannisport, his current domicile in New York, and the California address that his wife has and is maintaining until she retires. My analysis was based on, he's a lifelong New York resident, has maintained a domicile here his entire life, registered to vote here his entire life. He's always voted here his entire life. He is licensed to vote here. He is licensed to drive in New York. His professional licenses are in New York. His recreational licenses are in New York. He also pays taxes in New York, which I, I don't find particularly convincing because like <laughs> the fact that you moved out of state and didn't change your driver's license is not. Well, anyway, and we're not going to get into the dueling testimony about Kennedy's falconry license or whether he's committing electoral fraud by voting in a state he doesn't live in or that Rossi wasn't paid for his legal advice and isn't even admitted in the state of New York. So instead, we're just going to defer to what Judge Riba said, which is that this advice of counsel defense doesn't help Kennedy in any event. She wrote, while Kennedy attempts to deflect blame for his decision to use the Croton Lake Road address upon Rossi's legal advice, the testimony demonstrated that the advice was not based on Rossi's legal opinion that the Croton Lake Road address was a valid residence under New York state election law, but rather upon the need to use the address where Kennedy was registered to vote. Which... Yeah. You know, she's not saying you used a fraudulent address to vote in the state of New York, but she's not not saying it, <laughs> let's say. Right. So, OK, Kennedy lost spectacularly. What happens now? In New York, right, the Kennedy campaign has appealed. But um, as we've gone through, these are factual determinations and uh, the appellate court is going to defer to the trial court's determination. I, I, I don't think they're going to get bailed out on appeal. I think he's off the New York ballot. So assuming that this decision holds up, it does not automatically apply in any other state. It doesn't apply anywhere but New York. But the matters that were decided by the New York court are subject to a doctrine called collateral estoppel or issue preclusion. We've talked about this a lot. It means mm -hmm. that voters challenging Kennedy's application in other states can petition to preclude Kennedy from litigating for a second time whether he actually lives at Croton Lake Road in New York, right? Because a court of competent jurisdiction has said, no, no, you don't. They've looked at that evidence already. We don't want people litigating seriatim, right? So against collateral estoppel, Kennedy is going to raise three issues. First, he will contest the fairness of employing it offensively against him. It's called offensive collateral estoppel, which is where you have a plaintiff trying to prevent him as a defendant from raising issues. And courts, for reasons that would be way too long of a rabbit trail to go down, have, have drawn a distinction between having it used against you as a defendant versus having it precluding you from raising claims as a plaintiff. That isn't likely to make a difference here because the other voters would not have in in of in you know in future other states would not have had the opportunity to intervene in the New York case right so it's not like there's any sort of unfairness for them raising that issue now Second, Kennedy is going to argue that the judgment isn't final because it's subject to appeal. And there the question is going to be whether the factual determination made by the trial court is subject to collateral attack. And then third, and this I, I think is sort of the interesting one, Kennedy is going to argue that the same issue wasn't actually decided in New York if in the future challenging state, that state defines residence differently than New York does. And States do. So, for example, Georgia case law differentiates between 
domicile and residence. It holds that a residence is not necessarily permanent. Your domicile is permanent, residence not necessarily permanent, and maybe at some place other than the place of your domicile, as opposed to, if, if you recall, the New York law specifies that a residence is permanent. Okay, let me let me see if I can put this into English because I think maybe some of the the non lawyers got lost here. The issue is now that the New York court has said you don't live in New York where you say you live. What does that mean for the other states where he said, "Hey, this is where I live"? Because he doesn't, right? Do the other states now have to accept the finding of fact by the New York court that said? Robert Kennedy doesn't live where he put on this application, right? Is this issue an already decided one so that voters in another state can simply bring this judgment into a court and say, we'd like you to kick this guy off the ballot? And the answer is uh, maybe. And, and that's really going <laughs> to be determined by how the target state, right, if, if you march into uh, wherever else he's qualified to be, California, wherever, and and if a plaintiff challenging his, his inclusion on your state's ballot. The issue is how your state defines residence, whether it's whether it's the same standard as New York's or like like Andrew said, sometimes there's domicile and residence that are the same. Sometimes some states treat them differently. Right. And there's one more legal issue, and that is that a state might have a more liberal threshold for what counts as disqualifying on its application. Right. So if the state holds that listing your correct address is a matter of form, right, like the spelling and punctuation and uh, then mm -hmm. and not of substance or. Alternatively, they, they could say it is a matter of substance, but you have to demonstrate some sort of prejudice, right, if you're trying to challenge an application in order to kick somebody off the ballot. Then a court could say, yeah, you know what? RFK lied about where he lives, but it makes no difference, right? That doesn't hurt anybody. So, you know, we're just going to let the voters figure out whether to vote for him or not. And I, look, we're the party of ballot access. Now, I'm much more concerned with voting than I am with people being able to run as candidates. But, I, you know, it's not a bad argument that if you're a state other than California, who who cares whether Kennedy is a resident of New York or not, right? Like Maryland electors can vote for two California candidates, right? There, there's just no prejudice here. What do you think? Um, yeah. I mean, I have such a difficult time taking this remotely seriously and like assuming <laughs> that it doesn't make any difference than like, who gives a shit? You know, this is just RFK being quite silly. I, I do wonder. So there's been reporting this week that he has made overtures to both the Harris campaign and the Trump campaign, saying that he will drop out and give them his endorsement if they will give him some kind of job in the <laughs> upcoming administration. So I think I like he asked the secretary Trump of polio from the intro. Yeah, I'll, right, I'll right. I think I saw somebody saying like he's the secretary of measles or something like this is ridiculous. I, so I, the Trump campaign talks to him. In fact, there was a video leaked, um, I think, by RFK's son that had them talking about how terrible vaccines were and how vaccines cause autism, they, they being being Trump and RFK. Um, and then there was reporting this week that he approached the Kamala Harris's campaign and she was, um, you know, they laughed and didn't pick up the phone. They, they let that one go straight to voicemail because like, hell no. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I do wonder what he thinks the point of this exercise is. I, I understand what you're saying that you know, possibly his he, RFK's support might evaporate the way that the third party candidate Joe Jorgensen's you know, basically did nothing, which is why nobody knows who it is and why you and I just had to look this up. Who the hell is Joe Jorgensen? You know, that that it wasn't like Jill Stein. It wasn't even like Gary Johnson or, you know, Ralph Nader from uh, from all the way back. And I think the answer to that is no. I mean, RFK's got people like Joe Rogan platforming him. RFK's got, you know, RFK's got a constituency. There's a whole bunch of people whose like main issue is anti-vax sentiment. And so I, I don't think he's going to go away. Um, I'm, I'm not sure who he takes from. I, I've talked a lot to my, my son, Joe, who's been on our shows before. And he seems to think that RFK hurts Trump a lot more than he hurts Kamala. Um, in which case, it's fine if he stays in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I will just default to what I said going into 2016, right, which is very tiny amounts can make a huge difference, right? 77,000 votes. Did. Uh, yeah. Across Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, less than the amount of votes that, that went to 
con artist Jill Stein uh, decided the election in 2016. And you don't know you're in a swing state until that happens, right? In 2016, Nate Silver had Wisconsin as dark blue. <laughs> Hillary Clinton plus nine. Are you Nate right? Silvering at me? Are you oh, Nate um... Silvering at me? I, I do. This, this is not in this good Christian home. So all I will say is uh, that, yeah, we, we do not know... You do not know that you're not in a swing state and uh, don't don't try and game it out. So I don't think yeah. many of our listeners are, are FK Junior supporters. <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb there and say that you guys are not the ones that need to be told. Fair enough. All right. That's going to do it for us. Unless you are a Patreon over at patreon.com slash law and chaos pod or on law and chaos pod dot com. In which case, stick around. We got a fun story about Ron DeSantis. Law and Chaos Podcast is a production of Raise to Media, LLC, is intended solely as entertainment, does not constitute legal advice, and does not form an attorney-client relationship. This show is researched and written by Liz Dye and produced by Bryce Blankenagle. Law and Chaos Pod, copyright 2024, Raise to Media, LLC, all rights reserved.